Alrighty, Control Trends community, this is Ken Smyers with Control Trends. I'm with the one and only Roger Brevenak. We're here at the Poconos 400, actually 500 here. Hello, 500. everybody. And uh, Roger's very, very special. He does the Roger Brevenak experience. He brings us up as uh, Honeywell customers to an amazing event. But uh, Roger, uh, we'll talk about the Control Trends Awards coming up in 2016. 17. It's 2017, January, but we're going to celebrate the 2016 Control Trends Awards. Absolutely. Roger, you had the, uh, the honor of being the first PID recipient. Uh, we'd like to know, is it possible for you to give out the PID award at the 2016 Control Trends Awards? Kenny, if Eric Stromquist and Kenny Smyers are asking me to give out the PID award for 2016 award nominees, I, I humbly accept. All right. Okay. Well, there you go, Control Trends. Roger, tell us a little bit about the Roger Riva experience and the, what we're doing up here at the Poconos. Kenny, this is your second time to the Poconos. This is a traditional this is a very traditional location for IndyCar racing. This is the home of Mario Andretti, just a few miles down the road, Nazareth, Pennsylvania. This track was built for the fastest four wheels on, on earth, the Indy cars that raced the famous Indy 500. So this weekend, we'll be going for another 500 mile race here on the Tricky Triangle in the Pocono Mountains, where only God's lovely country can not be seen anywhere better than this. Cut, cut, cut. It's Ken Smyers from the Poconos with Roger Ebenak at the Roger Ebenak Experience. I'll tell you what, it's been a great show this week. I'm just getting done with the editing Sunday night. Put a couple final touches on, but it's going to be a fantastic show this week. Uh, Acuity Brands was in Atlanta. Uh, if you don't know, Acuity is a big lighting manufacturer that has bought a lot of very interesting companies lately. One of them being Distech, the other DG Logic. So we actually have a chance to talk with Dan Flaherty. Uh, and the president of this tech as well, as well as Eugene Mazzo. Uh, just want to get a feel for how they're rolling those companies up and the products that they're going to bring, be bringing into the marketplace. Also a very interesting interview with Luis Magueras from Neptronics. He stopped by and saw Kenny Smyers. Uh, they've updated their website, so uh, be sure to check that out as well. So with that, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And as they're probably saying at the Poconos, on your mark, get set, go. Welcome to Control Talk Now, your smart brother's video cast and podcast for the week ending August 21st, 2016. My name is Eric Stromquist, and myself, along with my co host, the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, Kenny Smyers here to bring you all the control news of the week that you can use. Kenny, welcome to this show, Big Dog. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's another great week in the controls business, in the HVAC world. Uh, we've got a great show here. We've got some very exciting news. Uh, well, we've got a breaking story, in fact, don't we? I think we got a huge breaking story, but uh, you know what? You guys are just going to have to step up for that because it is big news. Uh, Atlanta is, you know, really got started, Kenny, sort of as a city. It was an intersection of two railroads. And uh, that's where Atlanta grew. It used to be a, a town called Marthersville. Before that was called something else. But, uh, but because it was an intersection of, at the time, major technologies, if you think about it, the trains back then were the, the number one technology. And because Atlanta was an intersection of the technology of the time, Atlanta grew to the city it was today. And guess what? We've got an intersection right here in town, Acuity Brands. They're huge. They're just a little bit east of Atlanta in a place called Conyers, Kenny. And, uh, man, they are putting some stuff together. So we're going to take a deep dive into that uh, a little bit later in the show. But uh, for now, Kenny, let's, let's get busy, man. First of all, how are you doing? Well, doing pretty good, Eric. Uh, we're getting excited. It's a big weekend, too. Uh, we'll be traveling uh, to meet with Roger Rebenak up in the uh, Pocono. So I hope to be able to... Uh, Enjoy that and learn something from uh, Roger. He's always going to, you know, tell us what's happening in the, in the security worlds. I know that uh, Tritium and Honeywell are very excited about the uh, 3.8.1U and uh, and how that's uh, impacting the existing installed base and, and the future of uh, the security, you know, for Honeywell and Tritium. Well, I tell you what, it's uh, it, it's good stuff. You're going to see Roger and uh, Roger Rebenak works for Honeywell. We call him the most exciting man in the controls industry. He's one of the hardest working guys. If you were lucky enough to be at the Control Trends Awards last year, you got to see Roger in action as he presented the PID Award last year. Roger was the first winner of the PID Award, which is professionalism, 
uh, excuse me, passion, integrity, and dedication. And uh, Raj sort of exemplifies those qualities. So hope we'll get Raj back again this year to present. And at this time, Kenny, I think we should just uh, acknowledge our sponsors this week. So we got a we got an existing one, one that's been with us since the very beginning. We got a brand new one. So our existing one, in honor of the Reben Act, is of course Honeywell Controls. And Kenny, what can you tell our viewers a little bit about Honeywell if they don't already know? Well, I'd love to, Eric. I mean, uh, who hasn't heard of Honeywell? My gosh, one of the long, longest standing and, and, and most innovative companies in the world when it comes down to the, the things that push air and water through a building and give us the comfort that we're so familiar with. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Honeywell in the future here, but uh, you know, specifically in the environmental and energy, energy solutions, the products and supports and resources that Honeywell provides the industry at large is just uh, incomparable. They do a great job and uh, a lot of good stuff coming in the future. And a lot of great people, too. You know, the aforementioned Roger Rebenack, guys like Larry Weber, Rob, uh, Rob Anderson, Laura Kevitt, uh, Lou Jones, John Hutchie. I mean, all a bunch of great people. So a special shout out to them. And Kenny, our, uh, our new sponsor this week just came on this week. Distech Controls. And, uh, you know, I tell you what, we've, we've, uh, Distech has always done really well in the voting at the Control Trends Awards, and we've really never had a connection with them. So they never really sort of took advantage of, uh, of the opportunity to, to get to know our Control Trends community, but that's getting ready to change, as you'll see later in the show. So welcome to Distech, to the Control Trends community. And uh, with that big dog, I think we got some stuff to get down to. What do you think? We sure do. We, uh, like I said, it was another great week in the uh, the HVAC and building automation world. Uh, it's just we're saturated with new, new innovative products coming to the market. And uh, fortunately, we have the time to uh, filter some of that and put some great videos together. Uh, the first post is uh, the easy way to move and use data in a smart building. And uh, as you can see to my my left, your right, uh, we have Scott Mensch, the Vice President of Marketing for uh, J2 Innovations, and they're really excited about Fin Builder 4. Fin.4 is, uh, is, is just the rave of the, uh, you know, the, the big data world. So, uh, but this interview is a very good one because we get to talk to Scott. Uh, you can see the passion he has in, this, in, in what he does. You know, if you ever get people that really love what they do and they have that passion, they, they are very successful and they, uh, they, they can talk all day and night about the, the innovations that they bring with their products. But uh, we covered everything in this interview. Uh, we had the, the training coming in. That was the last thing we talked about. But that's very big for the people on board. We talked about how J2 is deeply immersed in, in the industry where they are working very closely with uh, KMC controls. They're working very closely with Siemens and uh, their, their products are just uh, going global. So uh, we talked about the uh, uh, the globality of J2 Innovations at the Realcom show. They had uh, another interesting aspect too is the templating is really taken off and support. Uh, you know the, the haystack is giving the is, is very it's catching on. People, uh, he, Scott told us that there was only a few six maybe uh, last year this year they ran out of signs because of the partners they had. They have over I think fourteen partners at the Realcom vendor show. So uh, great great post uh, great interview and. Uh, J2 is kicking it. Well, they really are. And Scott Mench is, you know, one of the bright guys in our industry. Very articulate. Uh, I like the way he turns the phrase. And, uh, you know, J2 is just very elegant the way they're doing things, Kenny. I think at the end of the day, uh, people are not only concerned with having great products, because you have to have a great product to even be in the conversation, but it's also, you know, how do you lower the cost to deploy? And J2, with the stuff they're doing, uh, like say both with their product, their standalone product that can overlay with anybody's system, and then then the sort of their stacks where they put them into th controls like KMC controls, uh, uh, Easy IO. They've got the Easy Stack in there, so we're seeing more and more of it. And it seems like Kenny, the glue that's holding it together is is the Haystack tax. So I I think if there's if there's one big takeaway that that our listeners out there, our consulting engineers, our end users. Our, our systems integrators even is that it really makes a lot of sense to make sure that uh, that your controllers or your systems are hay haystack compliant. And essentially what that means is, is it just allows your installers, the guys that install this thing. I mean, Kenny, one of your integrators told me a, about a term that he used called link monkeys. Basically, it's not that you couldn't get this data together, but you just had to pay somebody to sit in front of a computer and manually link different pieces of data up and, and Haystack completely eliminates that. So uh, that's a huge takeaway. I think all the major players are doing Haystack tagging now, but uh, it's, it's, it's something that's gonna be here to stay and, and we'll talk more. There's a Haystack conference coming up in Tampa. It's next May, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit out there, but hey, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to stay tuned for that. And if you can get there, that is just so worth going to, you know, you and I were at the very first one we've been to everyone since. And, 
and uh, some of the demonstrations you'll see. And, and Scott, we got we'll talk about Scott Mench again. I mean, him and Jason Briggs, the stuff that they've done live in front of an audience is phenomenal. I mean, and what they did in Chattanooga, what they did in Colorado Springs, the way they're bringing these different uh, data things together is just absolutely incredible and doing it live. So it really shows you the power of Haystack Tags. Sure was. It was, a, it, was it was fun. Uh, you know, they called it the session, the myth busters, where the, they, a lot of people uh, are still in the state where they don't want to the adoption curve. They don't want to. They don't want to give in to the uh, the new, uh, you know, paradigms coming in. And one of them is to make it easier to make everything, uh, you know, talk from the get go. They compared us against other industries where, if you're putting a printer in your office or you're buying something else, you know, it's automatically uh, integratable. It's automatically uh, the same protocols, and, and there's no time uh, wasted on doing the linking, like you said, or figuring out how you're going to make a gateway translate this protocol to that protocol. So the the, uh, the guys are really good at it, and um, they've got a lot uh, coming up. Uh, the thing about the – I think we're so interesting in our industry is that it doesn't slow down. It's not a static day in the neighborhood. It's it's one thing to another. And I think that's a big thing about the uh, some of the things we talked about the, you know, with the acuity and some of the other folks is they're putting these synergies together, and now it's starting to make sense. Now you can yeah. actually understand why data is so important, and then you've got installed systems networks there, and they can, presu- they can provide that data, and then you can make that data important, and then you can do all kinds of neat things we'll talk about. No, it is really, really cool. So, uh, well, good stuff there, Kenny. And... Um yeah, and our, you know, a special shout out to uh, our friend Mark Peacock at Linkspring. He's very involved with it, as well as Jason Briggs from J2. And then if you want to really know a lot about it, our friend Therese Sullivan, buildingcontext.me, she, uh, she does a really, really nice blog uh, for Haystack and puts their stuff together. So there's a lot of information available. And Kenny, it's, it's really cool to see how these guys are growing because, like I said, we were there day one when it was just sort of a concept, and we watched it evolve, which is really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, it really is, uh, and I think that's why uh, you know when we do these things, and that's why so control trans is so much fun because uh, by by doing this and investing the time and energy, we get to see the the latest and greatest coming forth. But meeting the people and explaining their insights and, and understand what the what's be, the motivation behind them. You know, if they have the time motivation, we can solve any any issues you know to deal with the uh, building automation. But now we realize that building automation is just a part of it. It's not the it's not the the end all our goal. It's to make building automation a seamless integration to the whole enterprise and then once you can do that uh, you're really taking advantage of uh, you know your, your technologies and its synergies is a reality to make to create more value to make a you know smarter yeah. decisions but uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of cover that on one of the, uh, the uh, future or the next posts coming up we'll dig, keep digging because the same subject well cool well I, I think our next subject though was we had uh, Stromquist had a live stream our Tim Shambly was uh, doing a live stream on variable frequency drives and, and you know you'll see right now that you missed the class it's because if you weren't there watching the stream uh, you missed it but the good news is we're in the process we will, we will we will be reposting that video so if you missed it you can check it out tim is a trainer extraordinaire man he is just absolutely passionate about variable frequency drives he's uh he's been with us for a while kenny he was one of the instructors here in atlanta at the tech school so virtually every tech in atlanta is you know it knows tim or has been trained by tim he was one of the first guys to do building automation controls back in the day and uh, just very knowledgeable he's a great teacher but he has one flaw i'm not going there okay no Go no ahead. no but you can put tim and he knows this you can put tim in, in front of ten thousand people he doesn't know and i tell you what he doesn't wink an eye he just rocks and rolls you can take one little bitty camera put him in a room of one little bitty camera and I tell you what, man, he's more nervous than, uh, you know, a girl at her first high school prom. He just, so we have to hide the cameras with the live stream. <laughs> so he didn't know he's live streaming. But uh, so stay tuned to that. that that's going to be worth seeing. And then uh, take us to our next post, big dog. All righty. Well, you know, we, we talked about the uh, disruption and, and the cause of the disruption with technology. A lot of it comes out of the household, the residential uh areas and so we realized that that's a trend to keep uh, you know on top of because as it is it, it it is implemented and deployed and and people in their residences are getting used to this technology they take that expectations with them in their cars to their offices and to the work centers and and, and want to know why they can't get that same kind of a you know relationship with technology so we next post is Honeywell's third quarter 2016 residential partner update now this is a uh, this is a webinar you have to register but uh, I, I did a preview of it and and I am just absolutely shocked at the technologies that these 
folks are putting together and what what Honeywell has done and all the partners they have. So just a quick review is that uh, you know study from Honeywell found out that nine in ten Americans long for a connected device to automate and control the features in their home, and we all know about the smart thermostats. So in fact, more than thirty nine percent of the Americans worry about locking their doors than they do worry about packing toothbrushes and all the other stuff you do when you travel, uh, and that one third of the Americans uh, want a security system and they can't they can't remember if they turned it on or off so they don't know the status. So that feedback of their phone uh, you know, connecting to their house and giving them status updates and allowing them to do remote uh, verifications, remote monitoring is, is you know, it's a good gigantic market. And uh, so when you get involved in this, you see that this, this is a parallel track going into the commercial space. Uh, we're not quite as, a, uh, you know, as progressive and fast, but uh, it's a really good uh, chance to catch up on the technologies and then uh, to sit back and try to uh, you know venture how this is going to impact the the building automation world and and you know stuff that we do day in and day out. Well, I tell you what, I, I think you know you know you and I have called the race to the small space for quite some time, which is sort of that middle tier of buildings that don't have anything in them, and it seems like there's a convergence, uh, you know, coming from up above with the systems we have. It seems like they're getting more affordable, but then you know I'm not so sure the residentials folks might not have the winning combination they carry, Kenny, because they're already integrating things like security and stuff like that. So uh, when you look at companies like uh, Echobee and InTouch, Nest, Honeywell for sure, I mean, the stuff that they're integrating at a residential level, it seems like that's maybe an easier jump to the race to the small space and coming from above. So uh, we'll have a lot more on the race to the small space. Kenny and I've talked, we called, we coined that term a while back. Um, I'm heading up, Kenny, to KMC here uh, in October. They've got a couple of products to get ready to release for the race to the small space. Uh, I know you and I will see what Johnson has at their meeting. And we already had the, the perennial uh, contenders in EasyIO, LinkSpring, uh, and other folks that, that we cover. So, uh, all right, Big Dog, let's get on to the next post, man, because we got some exciting guests waiting in the wings. Alrighty. Next up, Eric, as I said, uh, we get a lot of information with Honeywell. They released the Max Pro driver for the Web's Edge software. And what this does now is uh, we're seeing how the Niagara 4.0 came in. Now it's, I think, 4.2 is uh, pending. 4.1 is already out. But the security side of the house needed to catch up and get to 3.8. And they've done that successfully. And now that they're there, we're going to see more and more integration capabilities. We're going to see uh, you know, the opportunity to really uh, integrate. Uh, you know, Roger Reback had a dream where he, he saw the security side of the world uh, taking or having parity and importance in, in, in the building automation space because – uh, if you can get the access control, if you can go to the exterior of the building first, so you're looking at the physical security, you got lighting and parking lots, cameras. Well, they can they can enjoin the entire building automation, uh, you know, effort. So that as the car pulls up in the parking lot, we've seen some intelligent buildings. What well, begins outside the building, and as a person or vehicle approaches the building, it's it's integrated into the whole seamless, uh, you know, uh, opportunities. You know, so we'll continue to watch data come into play and and, and play an incredible role. But the the main features of the Web's AX. Uh, Max Pro driver is that it's a it's based on the Tritium standard video framework. Uh, it receives and display live video in a framework from the Max Pro NVR, so it can easily switch between live and playback video. It has the ability to auto discover the cameras, uh, all the digital and IP cameras, receives and processes events and alarms from the NVR, loss of video, uh, tampering, motion, and then, so you can configure it a lot easier through the security appliance. So it's a great update, great driver, and uh, I'm sure it'll be very successful. Oh, agreed. 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 Making Roger happy there for sure. And, uh, and I mean, speaking of great technologies, man, our next post, our friends at LinkSpring, uh, have got an update. Tell us about that. Well, they sure do. And, uh, this is, uh, the Jenny, uh, Genesis edge 100 controller. Now this, this was something we saw previewed and, uh, th this has a new aspect to it. And again, I'm still trying to get my head around how important this is because this is the new talk about, uh, in our industry, the edge controllers, you know, we all know what the, you know, how we're, Ken St. Clair did a great job of explaining that in depth about, you know, taking things, uh, in perspective as far as the flow of information and data, you know, we all thought initially that the data was going to be on this magic process up into the cloud, get, get, uh, you know, processed, uh, you know, get aggregated, you know, and then have, uh, you know, you know, 
meaningful data generated? Well, a lot of people are saying that's not quite correct yet because there's going to be data that can be processed at the edge, but you need the controllers. Because of the form, the fit function of, of, and the profile of these controllers getting smaller and smaller and the, the cost of processors getting lower and lower, we can have this incredible crunching being done at the uh, edge devices so that they can share the information locally and immediately. So it changes the whole perspective. But um, LinkSpring is very proud of this. Uh, so just delivering the reliability of Niagara to the edge, Genesis Edge products are a new generation of controllers combining the Niagara framework with LinkSpring's Onyx platform. The Genesis Edge combines a controller, gateway, and web server duties all into one single device, talking Niagara to the edge with real-time control, so bingo. Uh, and I know that they're very aggressive as far as uh, the competitive pricing. Uh, you know, the guys at uh, LinkSpring – uh, Terry Swope and Mark P. Talk and all the guys. they got a great staff, uh, are really, really uh, confident and this product is going to make a big, big impact. No, I agree. Agreed. You know, as you know, we make no bones about it. We really like those guys. We like the way they roll. We think Terry Swope has like, got to be the coolest executive uh, around. He plays blues guitar. He goes to blues guitar camp every day. But I, I think these guys, a lot of integrity, a lot of innovation. Um, and, and I think that they – they really see into the future and they sort of get ahead of the curve. But, but I think you're right. I mean, I think edge controllers and we got, you know, Alper gives us an update on his edge controller later in the show. We might not have time to cover that post, but I mean, those are the two players, but I think link spring is all over it. And it's going to be interesting to see how quickly other people sort of adopt this whole edge philosophy. But, you know, Kenny, I tell you what, man, the big news of the week, like I said earlier, uh, Atlanta is just rocking and rolling. Acuity Brands had people in and I had a visit from uh, an old friend. And you know what they say, Kenny? Good controls people don't die. They just change companies. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take this one. Our friend Dan Flaherty, uh, Kenny, he came in uh, to visit and brought some friends, which we'll be talking to here in just a second. But uh, Dan is an uh, interesting executive, Kenny. He's uh, been around. He started with GE. Rumor has it he sort of worked directly for Jack Welch for a while. I, I, I have pretty da darn sure that's true. Uh, he was had a very prolific co career at Johnson Controls. Uh, you know, sort of a marketing sort of genius, if you will. And, uh, you know, so Dan came by to visit. He... I. You know, I saw the value of control trends, as you know, we've been endeavoring to get with this tech for a while. And uh, Dan immediately stopped by, uh, brought our next guest with him. But uh, first order business for Dan, platinum sponsor for the 2016 Control Trends Awards. And uh, so we're, our, we're just thrilled because our Control Trends community is going to, get to know a lot more about Acuity about uh, Distec and about DG Logic, They're part of the bundle. Yeah, so a lot's going on with Acuity Brands in Atlanta. Uh, as you know, these guys have been rocking and rolling, making acquisitions. They're making a huge impact uh, uh, in our industry. A lot of our good friends, including Eugene Mazo from DG Logic, uh, have been purchased by Acuity, and they had all their partners in for a big, big uh, meeting this week. And uh, as you saw earlier in the show, one of our old friends, Dan Flaherty from Johnson Controls, is now their VP of Global Sales. And I tell you what, dude, uh, Dan brought the crew by. We are going to have a chance to talk to him. So real quick, uh, how about introducing our three guests today? I'd love to, Eric. Uh, we have uh, Martin Villeneuve. We have Dan Flaherty and we have Eugene Mazzo. Uh, we're very familiar with Dan Flaherty and very familiar with Eugene Mazo, and we're meeting Martin for the first time, but uh, he's been around for a long, long time. He's been with Distech for 17 years, and these guys are, are really excited about telling us something very important and new happening at Acuity. Welcome to the show, guys. Yeah, welcome to the show, guys. Well, Dan, hey, man, it's great to see you again. Uh, how about reintroducing your new friends uh, and tell us about what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, you folks know Eugene. He's been on Control Trends a number of times, but... Uh, I'd like to introduce Martin. He's the president of uh, Distec Controls and uh, my new boss as of uh, this week. So great to have you on as well. Thank you, Dan. All righty, Martin, uh, as we understand, you're the number two employee at Distec. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background and your experiences with Distec thus far. Oh, yeah. Well, my, my history, as you said, as a number two employee, I've joined Distec many years ago, more than 17 years ago. Being uh, a little bit the jack of all trade, uh, running, uh, running tech support, running development, running the test, uh, running basically every technical department of the company, all the way up to product management. And in the last years, uh, after the acquisition that this tech did in, in Europe, especially in France, I moved to France with uh, my family 
and run, run the business, run the brand, run the complete operation there in, in Europe. And was happy to report that we have been able, with the team, to uh, triple the business in five years in, uh, in, in, in Europe, which is not an easy market, I would say. Oh, dude, I had no idea you guys were in Europe. Uh, tell us about your reach. Are you guys global? Uh, definitely. We are a global company. Just in Europe, we are in 44 countries. Globally, we are more than in 70 c- countries. Uh, the repartition of our revenue is uh, about 30% Europe, 60% North America, and 10% rest of the world. Fantastic. Well, Dan, congratulations to you again on your promotion. Uh, tell us a little bit about your promotion and what you'll be doing for Distech. So uh, traveling the world again, I uh, did early on in my career, so running uh, global sales uh, with absolute uh, heavy focus on North America. You know, the opportunity with Acuity and what they bring really with the lighting industry and their channels to market, uh, we're all serving the same customer at the end of the day, right? It's the building owner. So just that partnership of our industry and building automation and the lighting industry, which is now... Uh, extremely high tech, and I'm learning more about that every day. It's an ama- it's amazing what a light bulb uh, can do today. Uh, tracking wheelchairs and turning different colors. I mean, really phenomenal via control. Um, so putting those two industries together and trying to grow uh, with Acuity, I think is going to be a tremendous opportunity uh, in North America for our channel partners. Uh, so much about you know companies sort of banding together to create bundles, if you will, of, of services, and and obviously you know Eugene DG Logic is part of the family too. So congratulations, uh, we had you on last week, and and you've got to come to Atlanta for the first time and and meet the QED folks. So tell us about how they roll. Are they pretty cool? Yeah, I mean it's great. More and more every day, I see all of the opportunities that are in front of us, and I share Dan's enthusiasm and. and and the capabilities that we're going to be able to provide to, to the various markets. Very cool. So what, what else can you guys tell us about Acuity? I mean, obviously lighting, and we haven't seen them much in the building automation side with lighting yet. They've probably been there, we just haven't seen them. But uh, what can you tell us about Acuity and, and, and their lighting and where they play and how they play and all that kind of stuff? Well, I, you know, just getting to know the industry a little bit um, over the last couple of months, you know, there's some significant players. And much like, um, you know, the heating and air industry as well, it's consolidated into a, you know a number of very large manufacturers. I mean, these are three, four, five billion dollar companies. And uh, five years ago, they they bent metal and they made light bulbs. I worked for GE Lighting a, a long time ago, and in Shanghai, you know, we were blowing glass and putting filaments. It was a mechanical process. And in the last five years, it's really transitioned into true technology driven. Uh, products and services. And to see companies that had that legacy in an industry change on the dime like that, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch. And now being part of it with all the controls technologies that we bring to the table and the software value that we bring to customers as software as a service, um, you know, really the sky's the limit on, on where this is going to go. That's good stuff. Uh, so what else can you tell us about Acuity and uh, what, what they do in lighting and beyond? There are a number of companies into the controls of lighting industry that the QEDs own, like Sensor Switch, Geometry, Byte Light, now Distech, now DJ Logix. So Acuity, like Dan said uh, five years ago, were more into the conventional lighting industry without the LED. Today, more than 65% of the sales of Acuity is with LED lighting. And they want to move into the direction of being a technology company and to prove it, the acquisition of this tech, the acquisition of DJ Logics and the other controls manufacturer. So they want to offer much more and have a long-term relationship with the building owner, things that you could not have if you're only a fixture manufacturer and provider. You know, very cool. Very cool. You know, Obama this year, the Department of Energy was talking about, obviously, initiatives in lighting, and I was unaware of it. There are 300 million of these troffers installed in North America today. That's one per person. I mean, think about everybody having a cell phone, and that's really a sensor today, right, in our industry. And, and now just the density of lighting. With LED, those get replaced once a decade, right, the longevity on them. So if you can replace them where there's a sensor included as well, now all of a sudden you have data. You have access to data at a density that in a lot of industries just doesn't exist, right? 
So you have some amazing, um, uh, you know, unique opportunities with and, and deals where we're trying to leverage what that data can bring. And recently, we uh, did a pretty good deal that uh, you folks were involved in, right? Yeah, definitely. This is one of the synergy that uh, this tech and Acuity have been able to put together pretty fast. Alone, both company would have been a, would not have been able to catch a deal of this size. But now we are able with the uh, with the visual light control to communicate with a smartphone and with the Distech uh, IoT technology to uh, communicate with the users. So communicate coupons uh, and and see uh, give reporting to the uh, owner uh, of where the customer are, where they uh, where they accumulate and where the employees are in order to make some match and ultimately bring more sales. So it's not a discussion that we have uh, just at the facility manager level, but now it goes to the marketing, to the sales manager of those organizations. So this is a completely other play. Yeah, I saw Scott Cochran say on your show last week, right, do we really ask the customer what they want, you know, the true customer? Or, we, you know, we asked that question, they said, you know what? We don't know where our wheelchairs are all the time. And we probably spend a million or two million in extra on uh, just extra wheelchairs, right? So what can you do to help me solve my wheelchair problem? And, and those are the, the discussions, I think, as a sales organization, we can really start having now with the great relationships we have in the market. Yeah, Kid, you got to be going nuts, man. Well, you got you got you got lights, you got cameras, you got I'm, the I'm, control system. I'm and, loving it, you know. And and what I'm really excited about again, and I keep saying it's 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 a whole new way of thinking. We're now using lighting networks to actually get to data. Uh, not only are we getting lighting data, we're getting occupancy data, we're getting indoor positioning data, we're getting building systems data, and utilizing all of that data to create value, uh, not just for the facility manager, but now for the business departments as well. Uh, you know, that's really powerful. Well, it is. You know, there's a there's a thing we've been tracking. Uh, we learned from the real estate folks called the three thirty three hundred dollar rule. And essentially, they're saying you know your energy savings are about three percent of your cost of a building. Thirty bucks is like the furniture and everything else. But the, the three hundred dollar piece is you know what you're paying your employees to work and so on and so forth. So, sort of the, what what seems to be in vogue right now is that you know the energy if you save ten percent of three percent, that's okay. But if you can save, have people be more three percent more productive. I had a $300 spend. Now you're really doing something. And to do that, I think you have to have some components. You have to have a great controller, obviously. You have to have lighting, an understanding of lighting and how that affects people, both psychologically and everything mm -hmm. else. And then you have to have the ability to tie those together with data analytics and, and, and get, make it usable, right? So, mm -hmm. so you guys, are, are you guys at Acuity thinking that way? I mean, obviously you, you, you yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm here because I want to be in a conference room with, Folks like this trying to figure this out because yeah. you know we own all of the pieces of, of the puzzle now. It's not via partnerships and joint ventures. Um, we, you know we own the smart folks in the room and in the industry. So that's that's I think it's exciting to see in the next 12, 18 months what solutions, especially ones that come from this guy that are sellable and, uh, and offer value and not just energy savings on a building. Right? But what other value can we provide customers? Um, because I think that's the differentiator in, in the industry. Today. So, Martin, I tell you what, being a controls engineer with your background, you must just be totally uh, like a kid in a candy store with all these different technologies you're getting getting to pull together and work with. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that you are uh, putting together. Definitely, definitely. I I was there when this tech was not making a, a million in revenue, and now we're we're heading to the hundred millions of revenue. Together with Acuity, we have the power to execute all the technical dream we had uh, in the past that we still have. Now we have the power to execute it together on a large scale. So it's very exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a very exciting place to be at this specific moment into the industry, I have to say. So Acuity, for you to have an understanding, uh, they have more than 20% market share into the lighting industry. So it means that roughly, 20 buildings on the hundreds are equipped with acuity lighting equipment. In some vertical, it goes up to 50%, so depending on the type of building. So this tech, even though we have been successful, we have been growing at a compound aggregated growth rate of more than 35% over the last 10 years, we're not, we're, we're not definitely not at, at a 20% market share. So this is the real opportunity 
to achieve our dreams from a product development perspective and deliver it to a market which is which will be much more responsive. So it sounds like Acuity is going to be a, a, a brand and a company we're going to keep an eye on. I mean, jeepers, just getting getting you guys together, uh, Distech and DG Logic, uh, and getting Dan on board while they're making some good moves. So thanks so much for taking time to spend with us today. Thanks, appreciate it, Eric. Thank Take you, Eric. Care. Wow, what great stuff. Is Martin like just one of the sharpest guys, uh, it, knives in the drawer? I mean, it's kind of cool when you get a, a president of a company that sort of worked his way up from the technical side and really gets it from that aspect. Well, yeah, because, I mean, when we talk about uh, some of the other interesting people uh, in our business, having that experience, you know, like uh, Luis Del, uh, Melgaris at uh, Distech, you know, was a, a master electrician. So every time we go into a project or see something or, or you know, he's got that deep, you know, well of knowledge to call on and rely on. Uh, well, this gentleman here, uh, Martin uh, Villeneuve, uh, and, and it, I get a kick out of it too because everything's getting so global and just the comments they made, uh, you know, 60% of the market being the United States, uh, 40, you know, 30% Europe and 10% the rest of the world and they're growing globally, you know. So we had an eye on Distech uh, probably two years ago and um, we knew that there was something going on here because of the uh, popularity they had in the control trends. Uh, they were always in the, in, the, in the mix for the products. But now we get to know the people and now we can see it, it makes sense. But, I really got a kick out of uh, Eugene Mazzo and, and uh, the ability for him to, to use layman's terms to explain what's going on. You know, uh, we got 300 million of these troffers out there, and, and every one of them has a potential location for sensing. And and you can do, uh, you know, just the incredible stuff because we we talk with. Uh, with Tree Sullivan, and she tells us about the contextualization. And we had the, the idea of what Apple did and putting these uh, snow people around, uh, these little snow devices or whatever they were called, where they're white looking around. And as people walked by, it, it, it read their locations and gave them information. So as Eugene said, uh, this lighting now gives you lighting data, occupancy data, indoor positioning data building systems data, dwell time, so that if your customer is sitting in front of uh, you know, a stand trying to make a decision, is he going to buy these shoes or not, bing, his, his phone goes off and he gets a 30% discount there to help incentivate the sales. So, I mean, all of a sudden, uh, the things that we used to always say were building automation specifically to our industry, we're realizing that's just a component now, that this now is data fed into the business side of, of the enterprise and it can generate uh, more value to that enterprise by having uh, just a seamless integration. So Acuity is, is probably the first major company that really spells it out and has the people to do it. They've got the resources to do it. A billion dollar plus, uh, I think, five or 15. I didn't catch the actual size of Acuity. I'll have to look that up. But they have the resources and they've got the people. So you've got the, uh, like you said, the, the guy in a candy store doesn't know which to do first because he had been read, you know, limited by, by budgets and limited by constraints. So they, they generated a, a roadmap, but they could only do one good product at a time because they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the people or the money. Uh, and now uh, they've got it all. They've got some incredible people. They've got the marketing guy lined up, Dan. They've got uh, you know the new technologies, UG Mazo and DG Logic, and they've got the experience of Distech. Now, watch out. I'm sure they're going to yeah. have. Well, no, no, no. I think they do it, and I, th I think Kenny, you know, as you know, we've talked a lot about the three. Uh, thirty three hundred dollar rule. Uh, we we picked up by that the, from the real estate folks, and and I think I got this right, Kenny. But it's, you know, basically you're spending three dollars on energy, you're spending thirty dollars on all the stuff that goes in your space, and you're spending three hundred dollars as the cost to have uh, employees in those space. So the buzz or the trend now is yes, yeah, saving you know ten percent of your three percent spend is good, but if you can affect the productivity, the three hundred dollar piece. You get 10% more out of that, or even 1%. Now you've adding a huge, huge factor to your bottom line. And at the heart of that, Kenny, is lighting, right? I mean, the psychological effects of lighting. And, you know, we knew that that existed. But apparently, Acuity is, is all over that. As a matter of fact, I was on their website, and they've got a, uh, a webinar coming up uh, that you can go to. And we'll put, we may put a link on it, but, but essentially it's called tunable white light. And, you know, we've known this has existed, but these guys are apparently right at the heart of that. And apparently you can take the white light, you can change the intensity or the hue of it, make it warmer or cooler. And that has enormous psychological effects. So this is particularly about classrooms and the effects that it has on students by having the light, the white light tunable. So I think you start talking about taking that incorporating it with Eugene's, you know, graphics and diagnostics and uh, Martin's and Distex controls, and you're going to have a formidable package. I think they're going to be re really probably be able to address that three hundred uh, uh, dollar spend probably as, as well as anybody else. So maybe well, you, better. Uh, 
you hit the nail on the head. I mean, uh, Andy McMillan was the first person that introduced us to the the whole concept of lighting, you know, and the psychological uh, impact lighting makes, and how the classrooms now they've got it all dialogued out. Where in the morning they want to have this kind of light because it, it induces energy. Uh, as they wind down for lunch, they they do this to the lights, and then when they come back from lunch, they know that all the blood's in the stomach trying to digest the food, so they they can compensate, or they, or they can actually, uh, you know, uh, really and truly bring uh, a positive uh, outcome of lighting to you know at the space. Uh, employees complain all the time now. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting more and more about the, uh, you know, not just the, the actual technology, but the impact and, and who, you know, who you want to please at the end of the day. So to get to that $300, and we heard another um, person come up and say it's probably more like eight. 8,800. That's right. That's right. So, so, I mean, the I- impact there is huge. So you're right. Going after that, that big uh, variable is going to lead, uh, you know, many, many innovative companies to go address the, the comfort inside of the space. Uh, like somebody said, every phone is a sensor now or potentially a sensor. So uh, if you can get that person's smart device connected to your, uh, you know, building automation system, it becomes a moving sensor because we know that we had some great ideas and the architecture of our understanding was was sound, but now we can make it better. We can really improve on that zoning concept, which leads to greater energy savings, but more importantly, greater comfort and therefore greater productivity. Okay, Kenny, it's it's confession time now. Okay. Because I know you've done this before. I've done it too. (laughs) Okay. I think pretty much anybody in our controls industry has done this at one time or another. We all uh, learned early on that temperature and comfort is 95% psychological, correct? Um, Don't even but, answer that question because I can tell you're getting ready to tell me a story. But it, but, but, it, but it is psychological. So back in the day, I mean, <laughs> be truthful, Kenny, because we will know. Our audience will know if you're fibbing with us. How many pupils. times were, were you, would you go on a job with an integrator at an office building or a school where somebody was complaining about temperature and you took and put a thermostat up with a dial that wasn't wired to anything? A placebo effect. The placebo thermostat, the placebo placebo stat. So, so, you know, we've all done it. We're not proud of it, but it worked, right? I mean, nine times out of 10, that would solve your problem with a person that could never be satisfied. Now, here's an interesting thing about light. And Martin was telling me about this, that believe it or not, if so light, you know, like you said earlier, has effects. You have like a cooler light, which has more of a blue tint to it, or a warmer light, which has more of a, an orange tint or a glow. And so what they're able to basically do with their integration, their system with the lighting is, I think they can do this now. They can't, they will very shortly. They're able to bump the temperature. So so somebody's complaining, like imagine a comfy app. Somebody goes, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not comfy. Give me, I'm too hot. Give me some cooling. Okay. Imagine being able to change the tint of the light now to now where it's a blue, like this is your first phase. So the light now goes blue, so you automatically feel cooler without changing anything but the tent of the light. No additional energy used. And then if they press it again, like the Compi app, then then you can bring some additional cooling on. And same thing on the other side, if somebody's right, you cold. Just, you just coined, hey, hey, you got the two-stage uh, psychological effect. like a, The, the two-stage two placebo stat? stat? Yeah, but the, you know, you're so right. And again, that's where I, I think the... The interesting aspects of what we do is that we do a lot of self-learning too, you know, because I never uh, – we I, I mean I knew it, but I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't know the impacts, but that makes so much sense. Imagine that, that you actually can have like a, you know, a multi-staged or a multi-response – uh, you know, scenario to somebody not being comfortable. So yeah. you could change what, well, I mean, if you could change the light from, you know, just regular white light to blue light and that's, that's a sensation like, you know, oh, it just got cooler. Imagine if you could change the, uh, more of the ambience, you know, the music. No, no, no. All, 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 all that. And then, you know, again, that piece also comes from the residential side where you're, we are put, putting everything together. But, uh, you know, I, I just think it's a trend we're seeing there. There's an, an advertisement in Atlanta for a company called a uh, uh, bright box, you know, it's on the sports radio stations and all that. So I got curious, and looking at them because they're integrating the thermostats, the stereo system, all of it. And it's, it's, it's a, called a Cool Ray company. Cool Ray is a, a, a residential contractor here in Atlanta. So they've branched out and, and they can afford to advertise on some of these stations. They're doing very, very well. But but I tell you what, Kenny, let's, let's continue sort of with this theme because our next post, we talk about Intel and uh, sort of how they're changing the way we're doing smart buildings. And you, you and I have sort of sort of seen this happen. I think we were at the first RealCon, Mimecon, where they really showed up in force. I'm talking about the Silicon Valley people, the Intels, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Dells. And uh, they're, you know, they don't have the same rules we have. They are completely rewriting 
what a smart building should be. And they're using technologies that, that we, uh, you know, you know, we know about, but we don't incorporate like Internet of Things and stuff like this. So this is a video that, that I found that Intel put out two years ago, Kenny. And it's it's still revolutionary. Not that our guys can't do it. Our industry can't do it. We can but what I'm sort of proposing in this particular post is we have to think differently and that we're not influencing anymore the w- way smart buildings are going to be. You know, the IoT people from Silicon Valley, the apples of the world and people like that are educating and the residential people, for that matter, are educating business owners on, uh, you know, what the, what they should expect in their buildings. I mean, so they're going to want to know, hey, if I can control my home with this. And this knows where I am and turns the lights on and off and the security and and the heating and cooling and all that. Why can't I have that in my building, too? Well, you know, the thing about Intel and and what uh, it's a matter of perspective, and I think you you made some uh, you know good points. You know, as human beings, you know, we like consistency. So we have sweet spots. and We don't like to move out of our sweet spot unless there's a a, you know compelling reason, which is normally either, you know, career wise, monetary wise or or technology wise. You know, uh, so it 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 becomes very, very interesting to see another perspective of, of, you know, a, a formidable company like Intel who looks at a building not necessarily first from the BAS system. That certainly plays a role, but what they do is they do quarterback from the person's perspective. So if you're a person and you're setting up a meeting, you know, what are your biggest fears? That the projector doesn't work, that uh, it's not cool enough, uh, that the lighting's lousy, and that uh, your, your meeting's going to go south. So uh, this thing gave you compete, you know, gave you a smart device where you could pre-register all your, your desired set points, your lighting scenarios. They gave you like five or six different scenarios where if you're doing a, a video movie, this is what your lighting should look like. You know, uh, if you're doing a PowerPoint, this is the ambient lighting you should have. If you're doing, uh, you know, whatever. And so to get that kind of a, uh, you know, script, uh, you know, so that means that all, everybody has to participate in those building systems. You know, instead of having each protocol has its own little computer screen and an operating station and none of them talk, there's an expectancy here that if you are producing, uh, you know, or you're providing conditioned air, whether it's air conditioning or heating, you better be able to integrate with our smart device because we want it all. And we right. want this woman, this woman who's paranoid about getting her meeting done and having a 30-minute presentation that's going to lead to a big sale or whatever. Uh, she can't worry about something not being there. So it's, uh, right. it's really cool. No, it, no it, is, it is so cool. And then, of course, they're using, uh, you know, Internet of Things. They're using wireless. They're putting things together. But, but I think what they're addressing, and this gets back to the three thirty three hundred dollars rule where they're focusing. We're starting at the $3 part, right? We're focused on saving energy and having the building be more efficient. They're starting at the $300 piece. Let's have people be more productive. Let's, let's, let's focus on the user experience. You know, I think it's a great thing. I really think it's a, I, I think it's a great thing, but, but I think as integrators, uh, as people that provide smart building controls, distributors, integrators, and engineers, we sort of have to rethink how we're designing and, and the concepts we're coming up with. So, well, you know, it's like, uh, and I was really happy that Dan Flaherty uh, commented on the post that we had with Scott Cochran last week, because to me, that's the way the world works. It works. Uh, the idea is when they hit across these these very, uh, you know, I, I think uh, strategic and influ- influential people, they make more sense. And what Scott said too is, you got to ask the customers what's the desired effect. So, if you're providing these building automation uh, capabilities and technologies. You know, and then you're going to be talking to people like the IT guy uh, or, you know, the people from CFO, uh, you know, COO, CTO. You know, you can let them know, ask them the questions to get the dialogue going of where you're going to bring that simple interface to give them completion, to give them connection. You know, so sometimes we, we, we try to do it ourselves and we don't we're unaware of the uh, of, of the reality of what what's desired inside that space. So we well, change our I, t- I tell you what, I, I want to make a refinement on this. and I need to ask Scott about this. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because the, the most innovative companies in the world, I mean, two of them that I can think of, one of them beat Ford Motor Company back in the day and then Steve Jobs with Apple Computer, and they had a little bit different experience. When Scott says, ask your customers, I, I wanna make a refinement on that, because I think he'd agree with this. Um, Henry Ford basically said he doesn't ask his customers what they want, because he said, if I ask my customers what they want, they're gonna say they want a faster carriage, horse and carriage, you know? And Steve Jobs, same thing. I mean, Apple was notorious for not asking their customers what they wanted. So when I think Scott Cochran is asking your customer what they want, I think he's sort of asking, not like you're supposed to know, because I think this is another trend. I think as distributors and, and people in our industry, 
they're not going to, I think he's asking for clarification. Hey, you know, are you really going to use all these data points? Not what do you want data wise, but okay. So what's really important to you? Not as a way, you know, to, to try to figure out what they need, but as a way to guide them to what they don't need. Cause I think, you no, know, no, but see, I, I think uh, what happens is, uh, you know, I've been out in the field so many times and, or, or you know, I've done it myself where the, the things we're trying to sell are square, and what the person's looking for is a circle. And we're trying to we're trying to impose a traditional approach towards, you know, selling something. Where I agree with you about the faster horse from Mr. Ford. And of course Apple, you know, there's there's no question about the innovation they've done because they've just like they did that transitional change or the paradigm change. You know, they they took a typewriter and made a computer that replaced typewriters. So but but I think what Scott was saying is that we have these mindsets. And I think you hit it you hit the nail on the head when you said about we uh you know, if it's not broke, uh, you know, don't fix it. Yeah, because these adages that pass as wisdom influence the way we think, whether we like it or not. And I think so. What, what I think is happening is we get all gummed up and ready to go, and we get a facility manager there, and we overwhelm them with all this feature benefits. You know, one boom, 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 and and we leave and go away, and the guy doesn't know what hit him, and he, yeah. he's not sure if information this problem overload. Was yeah. We don't need to saying, well, can you can you control the temperatures the way I want? Them? Can I right. remotely access it? So by beginning the uh, you know kind of asking the customer, what is our end game where's the end zone here and how do we how do we measure our march down the field to get into the end zone so i i, I mean but i don't disagree with what you're saying and i think i think we're saying the same thing we're just coming at the 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 point of 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 maintaining a new uh style not being rigid and and understanding that the way we used to do things is not going to be satisfactory in this new it uh, iot world so uh when we bring the technology into the space we can't push it downhill to them. We have to say, like you said, of this technology, which one is going to solve your problem? What are your problems? And we match it with technology. And I think we have a successful and happy customer. Well, I agree. But I tell you what, the one thing that is going to be a problem if you don't address it, Kenny, is cybersecurity. I mean, that's not going away. And uh, we had a really cool post from my friend Doug Wiley at Next Defense. And uh, tell me a little bit about that video. What do you think of that? You saw that. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what. That was probably the most comprehensive eight-minute presentation on the new reality of, of, of cybersecurity. And to quote Mike, Mark Petock, you know, to get the executives, uh, you know, thinking about allocating money. You got to pay for, 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 for services, and these services are important. But the, this thing here, basically, uh, I say, uh, you know, regardless of your position in the world, this video should ruin your day uh, because <laughs> it, 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 it should linger for at least a week. You know, you should be bothered, to, you know, to, you know, really bothered by the reality that there's people out there that if they have the motivation, the time, and resources, they can hack into anything uh, presently there. And I, I wanted, the, yeah, I want to tell you something really scary, Kenny, because this video is, is definitely one you want to watch. And you also want to go back and check out, uh, you know, these guys came in and did a, we did a live stream with the, this crew uh, at, at Stromquist and Company. But this particular cyber attack starts with, and I, I was just blown away because I got to tell you how this relates, with them getting a list of employees, emails, addresses, and then sending them an email that is compelling and has a link that you click on, right, that looks credible, and then that is called phishing, and then that essentially uh, allows a little bug or virus to, to actually get into their system, right? So let me tell you what I got this week, and I'm not going to mention the vendor, but it's, but it's a vendor that's, that, that we all know. And, uh, and I haven't sold any of their particular products. So this is why it was suspicious to me, but I got an email from this particular company alert, your invoice is past due. And then you go down and it goes, Hey, you know, your invoice is past due click here to get the details. And it was the type of thing. Cause they said, part of the phishing is, is something that people wouldn't think twice about clicking on. And then once you do that, they're in your system and dude, it was so scary because this is somebody in our industry and and this is a company that's in our industry that i'm aware of that we have a relationship with and i don't know how they got my email address whether they got it through that company's database or they just got my email address and maybe even heard us talk about the company you well, know. eric this, this video literally does exactly what you said so what happens is they they do extensive reconnaissance they'd get a list of all the company vendors they get the company assets that are stored on site that are serviced uh they go to the filing information with the fcc so what they do is they create a credible 
relationship. So employees receive emails from vendors every day that they visit or that they trust. And so it's expected that you'd get a, you know, like if you have a utility company, your water company or your, your sewage company or your garbage collection company uh, says, hey, you know, we got a problem with your invoice, you know, click here for details, you know, or whatever. Right. So that you nonchalantly, you don't understand that you've just been, you know, you've just assumed, uh, you know, that this was a credible email and that you got to be on your toes because then uh, they, they have customized spear phishing attacks that hack, you know, once it gets in there, it sends, it sets up a command and control center back to the attacker and they customize it to avoid the virus software to do the alerts. So they keep updating this. They go slow. The, the credible thing about this, the incredible aspect of this is the patients involved and the skills involved. Yeah, because it's the, usually six months before they even start trying to do anything, right? Yeah, they qualify people and they see whether or not they can get from your system into something that has a lot more meat and potatoes to it. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, but the, you know, the, the fate complete or fiat complete, or however you say it in French. Fate that compl they complete. Nice. So you've taken complete. some French. Yeah, we okay. get Martin from Distec to help us with that. So we're off on that. He can correct us. But, but they, they want to get into the read-only historian server, you know, where you manage the visibility to the generation units and performance of quality control data because then you can inject data in there that fools the people. They're looking at it like uh, when we talked about the thing that happened uh, with the – the uh, centrifuges in Iran, the, uh, the the operators looking at green screens, thinking, "Man, everything's going good today." You know, sipping on a coffee, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, things are going off the. You know, spending uh, hundred thousand uh, revolutions or uh, going around a hundred thousand times a minute and spinning right off their uh, their sockets. Yeah, for those of us you know, who've been through a divorce, we know exactly what that feels like. So. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right, Kenny, buddy. I think it's just, listen, I think what, what's happening, Eric, is these people have made something very important, very accessible. So when I say that uh, it's ruined your day, I don't mean to give you a sour stomach. I'm just saying that, you know, the insurance companies now are including cybersecurity as part of your premium, uh, you know, your opportunity. Uh, you've got to have a, uh, like Fred Gordy says, you've, you better have a plan, you know, a folder ready to pull out of a drawer or a file ready to open up to tell everybody what to do and what not to do because uh, it seems like there's is a, an inevitability clause. It's like the Santa Claus. You know, it's, it's just not a question of is it going to happen. It's a question of when. And if it does happen, are you prepared? Do you have enough insurance to take care of things? Do you, do, do you know what not to say? Do you have a message control system? Speaking of Fred Gordy, uh, speaking of, and speaking of Fred Gordy, Kenny, I mean, you know, been in touch with him. He'll probably be on the show next week. So one of the good news is we got people like Fred Gordy in the industry that can sort of help guide us through this. So I had Dan Flaherty from Distex stop by my office this week, and you had a special guest stop by your office, Luis Melgares from Neptronics. Uh, Luis, one of the great guys in our industry. Deptronics is a great company. Platinum sponsors for the 2016 Control Trends Awards. And uh, Luis told you a little bit about his new website, so check this out. A special guest today in the office, Luis Melgares from Deptronics. Luis, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, great community. Right, Luis, uh, I know you're busy and you're getting ready to catch a plane out of Pittsburgh. Where are you off to? I Back home for the weekend and then flying back again next week. All righty. Well, then we'll catch up to you longer. Luis, uh, Neptronic is on the move. Tell us about uh, some of the neat things about your website and some of the products. Well, one of the last things we actually added on the website is actually the new uh, virtual controls uh, catalog that we have that pretty much has all the different families of controls that we actually manufacture all in one brochure in a very, very easy to understand uh, way of uh, dividing uh, the products. Awesome. I, 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 write, I just happened to put that up behind you, Luis, so if you want to turn uh, and re kind of address the, uh, the video. Uh, um, right. So the first thing you will see, obviously, on the first pages is some of the projects that have been done. And on the left side, you will be seeing some of the feature, interesting features that our products have. Okay. And if we go to the next page, you will be able to see that the uh, uh, first thing that, that will appear are the different um, divisions that we have. Like, for instance, for instance, in this case, we actually have the fan coil page. Uh, of the different versions that we have. And interesting enough, if you just move your little hand towards the top to just keep on going, keep on going, where it says EVC, ah, oh, you see that? Suddenly there's a little uh, highlight that appears and with that you can click and go directly to our website and get any kind of spec you would require in order to furthermore the investigation you're going through. Awesome, Luis. Well, it's always uh, interesting. You always have something great to share with us and uh, we look forward to your, your next meeting. Very good. Your next visit, I mean, not meeting. Well, next meeting in Pittsburgh, where you're going to visit again. Well, there you go. We'll clean that All up right. a bit. Thanks, Lee. Thank you so much, Kenny. All right. And speaking of uh, great people, Kenny, our last post of the day was our friend Alper Boonsmiller from uh, BASSG. We caught up with him again at, uh, at Realcom Ibicon. We did a video. We saw him at, uh, at, in New Orleans at the Niagara Summit. Uh, he showed us his product and his edge controllers. And 
the guy doesn't stay still, man. He, he'd upgraded stuff. So in this last video, you get a chance to see uh, Alper's uh, upgrade. So great stuff from Alper. Well, even uh, you say about that, again, Alper's traced back to the uh, the origin, original version of the uh, the young guns. He was the energy, young energy guns with uh, Ken St. Clair. Remember that? Yeah. And like you said, you know, he's uh, updating his thing. He's adding features in, but he's also a big fan of Control Trends, and he uh, he's he's a sponsor. So uh, he sure is. Uh, I really uh, I like uh, what Albert's doing, and I think he's got uh, again he's got this uh, edge device thing down. He's got a better handle on it than uh, probably uh, he and, and and like you said, the, um, the folks at Linkspring probably have the the, the most uh, marketable products available right now. So if you're into that edge concept, these guys got products to sell you and support. No, very, very cool, Kenny. Well, I tell you what, buddy, with that, uh, man, I think we had another full show this week. So uh, special thanks to our sponsors, Honeywell and Distech, for the 2016 Control Trends Awards, which will be coming up in January in conjunction with AHR. And uh, special thanks to our guests this week, Dan Flaherty, Martin Villeneuve. Villeneuve. Villeneuve and Eugene Mazza. So, uh, Kenny, with that, man, have a great week. And to our audience out there, thanks for tuning in. Be bold. Stay in control. Indeed, Eric. Indeed, Kenny Smyers. 